I wanted to give out handouts because I, I want you to go home and consider what I'm teaching today. I don't want you just to hear it, <clears throat> excuse me, and forget about it. <clears throat> you can flip over to the uh, <clears throat> book of Romans. <clears throat> Someone pray for my throat. Whatever it is. Yes. Amen. Yeah, as you flip over to the book of Romans, I'm actually anchoring here lately. Out of the scripture in Acts, it says, Acts uh, 2.42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. King James says doctrine. What does doctrine mean? Teaching. <laughs> there you go, teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and Charlie, to prayer. That was the recipe for the early church. Now, what did the early church do? They grew. They grew. In fact, they, did, they didn't grow on Sunday mornings. When did they grow? Every day. Every day. Who was adding to the church? Jesus was adding to the church daily. Someone must have been preaching somewhere out on the streets, right? Telling their friends about Jesus and talking Jesus up. And that was really the purpose of the church. You come to church, you get equipped. But if people were being added daily... It wasn't just Peter, James, and John that were preaching, right? They, they were preaching, but everybody was going out and sharing the good news. If this thing, <laughs> that's, hey, Charlie, if he wants to run all the way up here, that's fine. He'd give me a high five. And, this thing was meant to be spread. And I really believe if we understand that the gospel is good news, we'll talk about it more. I think a lot of times we don't experience it. Like during that song this morning, it said, I could sing of your love forever. How many of you, when you're singing that, really mean that? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you really mean that? You could sing of God's love forever. Well, I know some of you probably do mean that. And others, I believe you're Christians, you're saved, but you really don't even understand that type of talk, you know? What do they mean they could sing about God's love forever? In Ephesians 3, Paul talks about experiencing God's love. It's one thing to believe in it, one thing to talk about it, but God wants us to experience his love. It's like I've talked before. I could show you an apple and tell you how good that apple is. Describe it. You know, all the parameters. It's red. It's juicy. It's delicious. But if I never eat it, and if you never eat it, you'll never know what we're talking about. Someone say amen. amen. So we need to experience this love of God. So if we're going to share the good news, we have to understand that it is good news. Sometimes... You know, people don't understand the bad news, right? That's why they don't know how good the good news is. The reality that without God, we're separated from God for eternity. All dogs don't go to heaven. Did you know that? That's, that movie's lying to you. They don't all go to There's bad dogs. They don't get saved. They don't give their life to Jesus, and they don't go to heaven. Did you know that's a doctrine in the Bible? Now, your pets will all go to heaven and be there with you, Right? I believe my dog's in heaven. You can believe what you want. I can't give you a scripture on it. It's very subjective, but <clears throat> my cats too. They're all going to be in heaven. <laughs> Most of them. We have a few of them that probably won't. But. but anyway, my point being that the good news is really good news when we realize that we're going to be separated from God forever if we don't receive eternal life. Do you know that man was born with eternal life? Oh, by the way, I'm talking about, Jeff, this, the apostles' doctrine, teaching. They were teaching. That's one thing that they did. The apostles were teaching. They were praying. We talked about fellowship last week, going to break bread together on the 13th. I'm talking about teaching. And they were fellowshipping around the apostles' teaching. And uh, we need to be taught the good news of God. We need to understand the good news of God. And I really believe that's what the apostles were teaching. In fact, I won't go there. I'm going to go to stay in Romans. In Jude... It says that the gospel was once for all delivered to them. 
the gospel was delivered to them. And it says in the last days there will come times when people will creep into the church and they'll try to change the gospel. Did you know that's in the Bible? And I'll tell you, it's going around everywhere. And I'm not a big anti-preacher. I don't come out against this preacher and come out against that preacher and come out. That's just not my thing, you know. I do well to take care of my own preaching, right? But the gospel was delivered to the early church. Now, they didn't know everything right away. Did you know that? Did you know that? You know, Peter was preaching up until Acts 11. In Acts 10, Peter started preaching to us, the Gentiles. Until then, he didn't preach to any Gentiles. He didn't know they were going to get saved. God had to show him through a vision uh, the, the Gentiles were going to be saved, and they started actually preaching to them, I think, in Acts 11. Then Paul came around with a revelation from Jesus that that was God's intention for eternity, that the Gentiles would be saved. But once that gospel was committed to the early church, right, that's the gospel. And Jesus Christ is the basis or the framework of the gospel. That's the foundation that they laid. Paul said that you cannot lay on any other foundation, the foundation of Jesus Christ. There's your foundation. When I preach, I don't know how people can get up and they can just kind of preach opinions when you're preaching the Bible. That, would, that scares me. If I just get up and start talking about my opinions, that's scary to me. And it's really scared me when I started doing it. You, know, you start drifting into that and um, you think, you're going to face God and you're going to answer, the Bible says teachers are going to be judged more strictly. Did you know that? It's in the book of James. Teachers are going to, so I really want to be careful about what I teach. So I want to say this, as we're pe uh, preaching on the apostles' doctrine and what the early church did, the Bible is the word of God. That's it. And what I teach, honestly, I listen to other preachers. I do, and I came out of, I came, went to the Church of Christ I got my degree from the Vineyard. I like the Vineyard, like their theology. Um, been to different churches. But when I preach, I'm not going to answer for what Andrew Walmack teaches. I like Andrew. I, said, I just mentioned him because a lot of us like him. I'm not going to answer. I know there's a certain guy that you like, uh, Gideon. You know, I'm not going to answer for what that guy teaches, am I? I'm going to answer for what I get out of the Word praying over it fasting, praying, seeking God, and of course I consult other people. Of course I study other people and learn from other people, but I have to answer. And, and this book, I remember one time I was at a church, and it doesn't matter where, I, I love the pastor there, but I remember I couldn't wait, and I've mentioned this before, but some of you are new, I couldn't wait till he got to Mark 11, teaching on faith, that all things, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, if you believe, you'll receive it. You have it. I couldn't wait. So the, the day finally came when we finally got to this verse. I mean, it was like a year and a half. And we finally got to this verse, and he taught about the Jewish nation, the fig tree, how the Jewish nation. It was a wonderful, wonderful message. He didn't teach on faith. And then the next week, we, taught, we just moved on. I felt ripped off. I wanted to know what he believed about faith. Like, what do you believe about faith? He skipped right over it. So I never did get to really see what he believed. Sometimes things are just easier to skip over, right? Aren't they? Skip over hell. Do you know that marriage was meant to be between one man and one woman? You know that's in the Bible? We could just skip over that. Do you know sex is for marriage? Did you know that? That's what the Bible teaches. Now, what else could I teach? If I'm a preacher of the gospel, the word of God, what else could I teach? I'll stand before God, and God's going to say, Brad, you lied to those people. You didn't tell them the truth. And there are 100 people in hell because you didn't tell them the truth. That, no way. That's a bad deal. I don't want to do that. So if I've ever done it, I repent, and I'm done doing it. We got to, now, I'm not hammering things. I don't want to hammer if someone, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is that right? Everybody in this room. And I've done worse than all of you. I promise. I really have. I've been a bad person in my life. And it's only by the, so maybe not Brad Green. You're right, Brad. Maybe not. Yeah. I've heard your testimony. You might have me. <laughs> but, 
But I've done worse than most of you, okay? I really have. And if I'm at all good, it's because Jesus lives in me. Someone say amen. amen. You know, and that's something. I, I, I'm, I'm getting to this message. It's right in front of you. We've got to preach the word. That's what I'm saying. It's the apostles' doctrine. We can't branch off, branch off of it. You know, can't get away from the word of God. And when you're studying, and I encourage you, if you do study other preachers, and you should, it's good to study and watch and listen, I do, but make the Bible your book of books. What's that guy, George Mueller, the one that had that orphanage with 5,000 kids or in Bristol, England? He said that that was a mistake he got into when he was a baby Christian. He started reading books about the Bible, book after book, and he quit reading the Bible. And he had to repent and get back to reading the Bible. The Bible's very round. It's very complete. And the more you study it, honestly, I think the more I study it, in one way I'm learning all kind of things, and in other ways I think I know less all the time. Amen? So I'm just, it's such a great, phenomenal book. And some people have great revelations in certain areas. I'd like to learn from other people. But make the Bible your book of books. And stick to the Bible. You cannot go wrong. You know, people talk about uh, evolution. They talk about, is the world this long or that long? I don't get off on some of the weeds that I don't understand. There's, I'm, I'm waiting for Gideon to set me straight and teach me about all this stuff, about, about the earth. and uh, someone. But I tell you, I don't even get off on it. I just teach what the Bible says, right? Here's what it's, well, was that one day, a uh, thousand years, or was it a million years, or, you know, I don't know. I know that God created the world. He says in one day, that's what I'm going to teach. I'm not going to stray too far from it. Otherwise, I'll be getting into opinions. Or if I do, I'll tell you, this is what I think, or this is what I've read. You know, they used to have this thing called the gap theory. You ever heard that? You know, like he created, then there was a big gap of time, and then after that, he kind of started up again. You ever hear that one called the gap theory? It may be true. They pretty much, some people believe it. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Boom! Then it was a long time. And then God started working again. I don't know. Were you there? Who was there? Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. He didn't go there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, that was when you were first dating, right, Jeff? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You could have at least said Larry. <laughs> oh, Charlie, yeah, Charlie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brotherly love. Hey, you know, so it's just a small church. We're just having fun, right? <laughs> We're allowed to have fun. My point being, folks, make the Bible your book of books. You may not understand everything. You may not know everything. And when people are preaching, we don't have the right. I don't have the right to change it. There are some things I don't understand you know, Ken, we were talking about the beast and the UN, how they have that beast out in front. And honestly, I don't understand. I've read Revelation more than y'all. I'm sure I have. If I haven't, very, maybe some people, they get into the book of Revelation and that's all they read. Is anybody out there? I guess what you study all the time. You know, maybe you got me beat, but I've studied a lot and I've weeded through it and I'm still digging into it, you know, trying to get this and that and understand it. But I know that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and I know that the word of God is the truth, so we're going to stick to it as a church, the apostles' doctrine, the faith that was committed to us. I want to talk about that a little bit, so turn over to the book of Romans if you're not already there. Father, thank you for blessing us, giving us understanding in the word of God. And I'll say this too, and I say it a lot, but I'll say it again because it bears repeating if somebody participates in certain sins, whatever, is this, does this church have an agenda, or do we hate people because they disagree with us, or they live a different lifestyle than we do? Do we hate those people? No way. No way. Don't believe that lie that you can't disagree with somebody and that you hate them. That's just ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That would mean that, you know, every Hindu hates me and I hate every Hindu, you know, because we disagree. Or that, you know, someone likes the Green Bay Packers and I like the San Francisco 49ers, you know? Like, like, you can't disagree with people. These things are very important issues, and we have strong beliefs on them, but we love people. Who's going to judge people at the end of the world? God is. Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, God's going to judge the world. And it won't be you and I standing there. 
okay? We're just going to preach the truth and stick to that, and God's going to judge people. Meanwhile, we're going after everybody. Do you need to repent to get saved? Yeah, you do. You need to turn away from your sin, give your life to Jesus. But we won't be standing there judging them. So we, we reach out in grace to people with the gospel and love people, but we still got to preach the truth. I remember there was a couple ladies I worked with at FedEx, and uh, they were lesbians. Am I allowed to talk about this, Jeff? Okay, okay. They were lesbians, and I loved them. They, they, there was a whole bunch uh, of folks that lived like that, and I loved them. I talked to them. We worked together. <clears throat> I would say they were my friends. They were really good friends of mine. But because I loved them and treated them good, uh, one lady came up to me one time, and she said, Brad, we know, we know that you love us. We, we know that you care about us. You always talk to us, your friends. So I'm not asking. I know that. You don't have to prove that to me. But I want to ask you, what do you think about my lifestyle? I said, do you really want to know? I said, because I can only tell you what the Bible tells you. And so then I told her what the Bible said. And she asked me, do you think I'm going to spend eternity away from God? What would you tell him, Ken? I said, the reason that any person is going to spend eternity away from God is because they reject Jesus Christ. And just like I had a conversation with the guy, is it okay if I tell stories? I'm sorry, just, it helps the message. There was a guy one time, I was at uh, Easton. Oh, Jesus told stories. Thank you. Thank you. I was at Easton once, and there was a young man, it's African, African-American man, I've told the story, but he was over there, and the Holy Spirit said, talk to him. Go talk to him. So, I like to obey the Holy Spirit. How did I know it was the Holy Spirit? Gut, Gut right here. Like, oof. You know, just right here. Like, can you go steal a cookie? Something says, don't do it. Holy Ghost, okay. So anyway, not that you'd ever do that. <laughs> not that you would do that. Yeah, yeah, then you really get a lot to work with. <laughs> Someone got that. So anyway, I said, I, I walked over. I said, hey, how you doing? I started talking, and he said, I'm not making fun. He had a lisp, okay. I just, he had a lisp. And, you know, I thought, Chances are, you know, and sure enough, he's, so I said, uh, where are you? I said, you know, as so I could tell God wanted me to talk to you. I said, do you know Jesus? And he said, well, let me ask you a question. He said, I'm a homosexual. He goes, what do you think about that? What do you think of the Bible? And I said, stop, time out, put the brakes on. You're going to Z. I want to start here at A. I said, because how I answer you is really important. I said, but I need to know, number one, tell me, what do you think about Jesus? Can you answer me that? He's, well, I don't know. I said, we need to start right there, don't we? Before we talk about, hey, it could be adultery. Let's, talk, let's forget about alternative lifestyles. It could be adultery. What's adultery? Yeah, cheating on your, sleeping with another married woman or another married man. You're cheating on your spouse. You can do it in your heart and never touch her. Just want it. Jesus said it was just as bad. So let's don't, let's t- everybody take your halos off, polish them up a little bit, and put them back on, right? It could be that. I said, before we talk about adultery, let's go there. I said, you, we need to know who Jesus is. Do you believe in Jesus? And they said, okay, well, yeah, let's say I do. Okay, now I want to know. And here's the point. What do you think of the Bible? Is it the word of God or isn't it? Aren't we getting down to brass tacks? Because now you're moving away from what is the opinion of Brad Kittle or what's your opinion or what's my opinion. What does the Bible say? Because if you believe that Jesus is Lord, then you're going to believe the Bible because Jesus taught from the Bible. His whole life came out of the Bible, everything about him. In fact, he was literally the word of God made flesh. He endorsed the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, rightly divided. He endorsed it. So if you believe in Jesus and you're following Jesus by the Spirit, you're going to believe in the Bible. So what does the Bible say about it? Come on. And we don't have, so, so we got that far. He wasn't sure what the, he wasn't sure if he was a Christian or going to follow Jesus. So we never did talk about the answer to his question and I did talk to him. I met him a few more times. In fact, you know, we, we, I won't go into your good deeds, but we helped him in some ways, and we loved him. And then, you know, how these things are. 
after we talked to him a few times, went over to Columbus, did some things with him. We lost contact with him. Never talked about that issue again. Because for me, it was no different to me. His sexual life was no different than your idolatry. What do you mean? Church, the things that we put above God. Some of us, no con and I mean this absolutely, this is a point, it's not a condemnation. Some of us this week or last week or during bowl season will watch maybe 30 hours of football and crack our Bible for 10 minutes and the Bible bores us, right? I'm not, there's no condemnation. That's called idolatry. There's something in your heart that drives you more than the, Jesus does. There's something you love more than Jesus. If we want to really make this thing work in our lives, it's like these songs today. We got to learn to love or ask God to put us in a love in our heart for Jesus. Because when Jesus becomes paramount in our life, everything's settled right there. I watch football. I like it. But football's not my Lord. I love to run. All the time. I like tennis shoes. Running is not my Lord. I can throw it on the altar today. Save me a lot of pain and suffering if I did. People are kind of weird at like running. It hurts. Did you know that? Running hurts. We're kind of a crazy breed. But I make sure all the time before God, but it's so easy to allow things to creep into our life that take Jesus off the center stage. There is no happier life than the life that's centered and focused on Jesus. Is that true? So anything in your life that takes that place would be an idol. So we have to get rid of the idols in our life. Is that true? Yeah. It is true. Come on. All right. Come on. All right. So let's go. So what is the gospel of God? If you read in the Bible, in, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says he was set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel is good news. The reason the gospel is good news is because we've all sinned, Romans 3.23. Everybody in this room has sinned, and some of you probably this morning. Amen. Some of us are even claiming it, you know. Now, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I have, you have, everybody. We're all on equal playing ground. Our sins are different, but we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because we've come short of the glory of God, the gospel says we are separated from God. We are dead, we are without Christ, we are lost, and we do not have any hope of eternal life. When we die, we are being separated from God forever. And even if there wasn't a hell, which there is, just being up and looking into heaven and seeing your mom there and your grandma, and they're all partying with Jesus, they're all having a, a feast, and you're sitting there looking on the outside, looking in, and you get whacked for eternity, that alone would be enough, wouldn't it? To see everybody that you knew going on to glory, and you're going to cease to exist even for a moment. You're gone. Wouldn't that be horrible? It would be. But we're born sinners. We've all sinned. There's no one in this room that can tell me you haven't. I know better. I've been around you enough. I know better. And because of that, we're separated from God. The reality is, when Adam sinned in the garden, all men became sinners. That's what the Bible teaches in Romans 5. Everybody became sinners, you know? And that's why I mentioned last week to, to uh, Brielle and Isaiah, I said, you know, uh, even Christians have to deal with what the Bible calls the carnal nature. It's really your flesh. I don't want to go into that today. We've even got to watch over our flesh as Christians. We have something to deal with. But we're all separated. And Paul says that he served in Romans 1.14 with his spirit in the gospel of God's son. So the gospel of God is the gospel of his son. Now what does the word gospel mean? I'm just teaching, guys. What does the word gospel mean? It means good news. So the gospel is the good news about Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know if you died that you would spend eternity with God, you can leave here today beginning your destination with God for eternity. You can accept Christ. You can decide today to put your past life behind you, and you can decide to follow and serve Jesus, and you're going to spend eternity with God strictly by the grace of God. Nothing you can do to earn it. Nothing you can do to recommend yourself to God. You can't go back and make up for your past sins. There are too many. You can't do enough works to get rid of them. You can't do anything to get rid of your past sins. And beyond that, you can't do anything to get rid of your sinful nature. Did you know that? 
you were born a sinner, and you're good at it. Aren't you, Ben? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I'll answer that for you. Hey, amen, yeah. And the fact is, I am too. We're good at it. We're good at sinning. We're born. Kids are born liars. Did you get in that cookie jar? No, no, I didn't get in the cookie jar. Jimmy, did you say that about your sister? No, I didn't say that, no. Or, uh, what, what, you pointed the finger at me last night. What was it? Like, just by nature, <laughs> you know, try to stay away from that. <laughs> we lost something, or we, something that you said, uh, you had it, last, remember? Yeah, what was it? You remember? Something, anyway, like first thing Pam did, you had it last, like, whoa, I felt like Adam and Eve in the garden, you know? <laughs> oh, I know what it was. We have a gift for you. And uh, we couldn't find it. And Pam said, well, I gave it to you. I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> and we started, like, I felt like Adam in the garden, you know. No, it, he has it. But we found out where it was. It's natural. <laughs> Pam. <laughs> Let's cut to the chase, right? <laughs> There's none righteous. No, not one. But it's just funny, our natural response a lot of times is to blame somebody else. I remember lying just because I was so afraid. I just pointed to somebody else because it scared me. I was being accused of something that I did. And Kevin did it, you know, just natural, just flew right out of me, just like I was a sinner. And uh, folks, we're all that way. When I was little, I have three brothers, and me and one of my brothers, we were taught not to cuss. Did you ever cuss, Chuck, when you were young? Okay. We were taught not to cuss. It's cussing bad. Yeah, it's bad. You get, it's filthiness coming out of your, it's bad. You don't want to cuss. I believe in holiness. But I, maybe I did or didn't back then. I went to church and I knew it was wrong. But me and my brother, Kevin, I'm sorry, Kevin, if you're out there. We got into a cussing contest just out of nowhere. One, one Sunday night, we got out there and we never cussed before. And all of a sudden, he cussed at something. I, I can do better than that. <laughs> so I cussed. I'm not kidding, pretty soon we were cussing at grass. We were seeing, we cussed all night long, and we'd never cussed before. It was like there was a cussing demon in our front yard, and that thing jumped on us, and we just cussed. I can't tell you what we said. It got worse and worse. I don't think I ever said Jesus' name in vain. I had my line, but, that, but everything else I said. Talking about a piece of grass, that made me a piece of grass. Well, yeah, what about that bleep bleep telephone pole? Why, why was I doing that? It just came out of me. I went to bed at night, and I was laying there thinking about hell. Thinking like, am I going to go to hell now? I'm mean, really, that's because we were taught certain things. And I was really scared. I, did, I don't know where it came from. Now, I get a little more serious here with my sins. You get 13, 14 years old, a little older. And you know, girls start, if you're a normal guy, girls start looking good to you, right? And I started on a long track of chasing girls. Man, that messed my life up for about 15 years. Just started chasing girls. And I mean, I, my intentions were not good. Mom and dad out there, you got daughters. Not every guy that's smiling and cute and looks nice, it has good intentions about your daughter. I promise you. Because you've got hormones, and if you're not under the sway of the Holy Spirit. But it was easy for me. Now I want to ask an honest question. How many other guys struggle with this, maybe? Just me and Gideon. Well, that's good to know. The, pre the preacher and the worship leader. That's good. <laughs> We're the only two, Gideon. <laughs> Praise God. See, I said God takes the biggest sinners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think God takes the worst ones that makes us preachers. I really do. <laughs> but my point is, and you know, I'm, we're joking, and we can't joke, but... but uh, my point is, it was easy for me to sin. It just came natural. But I, I did. I know Gideon did too. We talked. I felt guilty about it. I knew I was doing wrong. I knew I was doing really wrong. I knew I was hurting girls, and I knew I was doing things I shouldn't do, and I knew I was going against what I was taught as a young man. I felt guilty, but I was just bound by this thing. It, it, I didn't control it. It controlled me. Even as an adult, there have been times in my life when things in my life, when I uh, edge toward them closer, what I noticed about sin is you don't control sin. Sin controls you. Anybody ever see those cigarette commercials? Did I send that to you? Um, I was talking about it in youth group. And this, you ever see the cigarette commercial where this guy, 
this real midget guy comes up to this real tall guy, and they're watching football or something, and he, this little guy has long hair, and he walks up, and he's like, dude, come with me, and he grabs him, knocks him over, and drags him outside. You never seen that one? And he drags him outside, right in the middle of the football game with all his friends, and the guy's sitting on the porch, and all of a sudden, this guy wiggles his hair, jumps up, and jumps between his two fingers, and he becomes a cigarette. Anybody ever see that? The point of the commercial is cigarettes are bullies. You don't control them. They control you. You know it because you go out and these guys do smoke breaks at school. We used to have a smoke pit. They probably don't anymore. But we used to have smoke pits. It'd be like 10 below zero. And it'd be guys out there smoking at 10 below zero. Like with a cigarette. I'm going, I don't want to smoke because I don't want to be drugged out there to 10 below zero to smoke a cigarette. My point is. Things control you. And we know folks that struggle with alcoholism, and alcohol controls them. We know folks that struggle with drugs. Drugs control them. We know people that are full of jealousy and lying and just hatred. And, you know, any sin you can think of, sin, if it's got you, the Bible teaches that it is your master. Does God want sin to be your master? No, he does not. I got good news for you. It doesn't have to be. Well, Paul calls this his gospel. <clears throat> because we're, and I'm getting down to gospel 101. I need you to listen. This is the basics of the gospel, the apostles' doctrine. Paul knew what the gospel was. This is it. We are born sinners. We can't be anything but a sinner. You can give us 1,000 or 600, how many is it, Evan? 625 laws in the Old Testament, 612 or something like that. Let's just say 612. There's 612 laws in the Old Testament. You can give me 612 laws and say, if you abide by every one of these laws, then you're righteous. What's the problem with that? No one does it. Even Moses didn't do it. Nobody obeys, ever has obeyed the law. Now, let me give you a quiz. Why doesn't anybody ever obey the law? I've already told you. This is my gospel, Paul says. Why is it? I've already told you. What's that? But why? You're right, Larry, but why? Ken hit it. Yeah, because, of, because we're all born sinners. Yeah, we're all flesh. We've lost, the Spirit of God has departed from us. We're not in intimate fellowship with God anymore, and you can't do it on your own. So if you can't do it on your own, somebody else has to do it for you. It's like, you know, it's like having a little kid up there, and he's trying to lift the barbell. And he just can't do it. All of a sudden, dad sneaks up behind him and puts his two arms. And the kid is pretending like he's lifting it. But dad picks that thing up and heaves it up in the air. And the little kid's up there like he's doing it. You need somebody to lift that barbell for you. You need someone to stand between you and God and your sinful life. You need to be saved. You need to be saved. You need to have a new life. You need your sins wiped out, and you can't do anything to get them wiped out. Sure, you can kill a cow or you can kill a sheep every year and just keep putting it off. But sooner or later, you're going to have to answer for those sins because that blood of bulls and goats can't take away your sins. That's just a temporary thing God was using until Jesus came. I can't do it. But Paul taught that the gospel, the good news... Was, it's called the gospel of Christ, was the good news or the power of God unto salvation. It's all right here. You go home and read it and study it. There's more. Just read the whole book of Romans. But there's, there's more. It's in your paper. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The good news about Jesus Christ, the gospel of God's son, is good news for you. God did what you could never do for yourself. Jesus went and died on a cross... And on that cross, he took every sin you ever committed or ever will commit. Anything you've ever done wrong, it's been paid for in full. There's a message on your eternal resume, and it says, paid in full. Boom. Amen? Paid in full. And God did it because he loves you. He loves you. And he's always loved you. He's not this mean, nasty Zeus God throwing bolts at you. Your own sin condemns you. God's not condemning you because you know that because Jesus didn't condemn people. Jesus was calling sinners. Religious people or people that thought they were righteous, he was always fighting them. He was always calling sinners. Come follow me. He didn't go after rabbis and priests. He went after fishermen and shepherds. What's the chosen? 
You'll get it all on the chosen. He went after common old sinners. That's who he liked. He didn't like pretense and arrogance. He wanted people to know, hey, you're all in the same boat. You can be a good sinner or a bad sinner, but you're all in the same boat. And I love you all. God so loved everybody. That means we talked about lesbians and idolaters and idolaters and he loves everybody. There's no one that God doesn't love. And if you're alive and your heart's beating, you can be saved today. If you're out there listening and you're apart from God, you feel separated from God, you can be saved. You can give your life to Jesus. And it's the beginning of a journey. Like what Dan says, the whole point isn't just to get saved, but we can begin our journey of following Jesus today. The gospel is, is that he wiped away all your sins. Now get this, this is even better news. Not only did he wipe away all your sins, but he wiped away the old sinful person you used to be. There's something worth shouting about. Bible says you are a new creation. Doesn't it say that? I don't care how you feel. I don't care what your emotions tell you. I don't care how bad of a day you're having at work. I don't care if the world is all caving in on you. All that stuff is coming at you to knock you away from your faith anyway. The Bible says you are a new creation. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Same, says the same thing in the book of Colossians chapter 3. It says, put off the old man, put on the new man. You're a new person. You have truly been born again. If any man has not the spirit of Christ, Romans 8, you're none of his. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, you don't even belong to him. Did you know that? The spirit of God's in you. That's why you can't always trust your emotions. You, I mean, emotions are important. I need them. You need them. But you can't always trust them. We can trust the word of God, and we can trust the spirit of God. When you're born again, Jesus lives in you. Why, how else could you walk in the Spirit, Maria? How else, <laughs> I'll wake you up. How else could you walk in the Spirit? You have to have a Spirit, right? And you have to be able to trust it. The Spirit is your Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit. You can walk after it. So when, when your old carnal nature, we talk about the flesh, who is an idiot. Sorry about that, but your flesh is stupid. It'll do anything. Your flesh will take math and snort it until you weigh 100 pounds. I know people that do it. Your flesh will sleep with every woman in town until your wife leaves you and you're a lonely alcoholic dying at the age of 50. Your flesh is ignorant and unlearned. Your flesh will lie to you about Jesus. He'll tell you God doesn't love you and just give up and kill yourself. Life isn't worth living. Your mind and your emotions, you bring those under the control of the word of God and the gospel of God. I want to get something settled. God loves you. And he always will love you, and he's never not going to love you. Even if you do, do wrong, he still loves you. The question is never whether God loves you. He's got your picture on his wall. His eternal wall, his eternal canvas. Your picture's up there, and it has a smile in heaven. Amen. You got a big old smile in heaven. You know, I throw freezing on a telephone line. God's got you smiling at a beach when you're in heaven. Amen. I'm going to prove it to you right now. But now a righteousness. We all need righteousness. That's what the gospel's about. It's about righteousness. Healing's in there. Casting out devils is in there. Raising the dead is in there. But the core of Paul's gospel is righteousness. If you're not righteous, you can't pray. God doesn't hear wicked people. Do you know what the Bible says? The prayer of the wicked is an abomination to God. If you're not righteous, you can't even pray. Don't have no basis that God could answer or not. It's just totally up to his mercy. If you're righteous, you have a basis to go to God. Lord, I'm your son. Well, let's, let's read it. But now a righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. It's not the law. And that's the law of where it's not works, Diana. It's not works. It's not you being a better person. That's not how, not how you get saved. God's going to make you a better person. But it's not trying to be a better person. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God is how? Someone read that. It's about the fourth one down. The righteousness of God is through what? Faith in Jesus Christ. To who? Some people that are living good. What does it say? All to all who believe. I know this is basic. We need to get the basics, okay? Everybody that believes. i got ten minutes. Praise God. I can... Preach from Genesis to Revelation in 10 minutes. 
No, I can't. <laughs> Very abbreviated. Reader's Digest. All who believe. So anybody out there listening to my voice, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or anybody here, you don't know that you're saved. If you choose today to believe, it's not my gospel, it's not Dan's or George's or Jim's. The Bible says anybody that believes will be saved. It says it over and over. It says it so many times that you just have to believe it. God so loved the world that whosoever believeth. I, I could teach sanctification, and I, and I will. I will teach sanctification. That means being living good. Living good's in there. I don't want to get sidetracked. All who believe. And I, and I put this in here. I jumped to Romans eleven six, 6, just so you know what he means by the law. It says, but, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. You can't work for it. Law means works. Get that. Law, when you read law, it means you working for it. It is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. You can't work for your salvation. When you get saved, Paul said, you guys were running a good race. Who cast a spell on you? Now you think you got saved by grace through faith. Now you think you're going to go back to the law and you're going to try to earn what God gave you freely. He says you can't do it. You're getting messed up. Someone's bewitched you. Someone's thrown a curse on you. The way that you walk is the way that you got saved. You got saved by God's grace through faith. You walk by grace through faith. You, that's walking in the spirit. You do it by faith. And I promise you, people that walk in God's grace by faith live far holier lives than people that try to live in their flesh and be holy. I promise you. Because the carnal mind or the fleshly mind, your natural mind, is at war with God. Romans 8. You can't do the law. You can't please God in yourself. And you can't even try to. You're at war with God when you try to do it because the law is repugnant to your flesh. Romans 7, everything, everything that's in your flesh that tries to be righteous is a lie. Your flesh wants to sin. It wants to look good doing it. It's true. Romans 7, the good that I would, I can't do. The bad that I would, your flesh is lying. No way to be saved. I'm gonna get, this is the bedrock of the gospel that Paul, the apostle, taught. No way to get saved but by God's grace. So don't start this thing by grace I preach on coming to church because you should come to church. Why don't you want to come to church? We're brothers. We love each other. We have a common mission. We have the greatest calling in the world to serve Jesus Christ. We can help each other. We can support one another. We can worship God together. We can give to support the ministry. Why wouldn't you want to come to church? But going to church is not what saves you. Or even reading your Bible isn't what saves you. Or praying isn't what saves you. Those are things that you do when you fall in love with Jesus who died for you. They come natural when you walk in the Spirit. Even doing those things should come out of the heart of man. I love Jesus because I was such a rascal and he saved me. Sometimes I try to earn it again and it just gets wretched. It gets miserable. It's miserable trying to please God in your flesh. Don't, don't misunderstand. I love to please God. I had a couple Utica ex-footballers this week, man. The Lord had me talking to them. I love that stuff. You think that's hard for me? I, sometimes it's a little scary getting over there talking to somebody. But man, when I get to talk to somebody about Jesus, I love it. For, sometimes prayer in my flesh is hard because your body's tired. You've been working. You don't want to. But man, when I get that sweet spot with the Lord and the Lord's talking to me and I'm talking to him, that's lovely. I love it. Don't you? You, you may have to wrestle through your flesh a little bit to get there, but it's sweet. No, serving God, isn't the fruit of the Spirit joy? It's when we don't understand God and His love that this thing becomes very, very difficult. When you don't understand that God loves you, even in the moment of your sin. When I first got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, living pretty good, maybe four months into it, I remember specifically sinning. Specifically sinning. And I remember crying, just crying, bawling my eyes out. And you know how you're taught, you know, just thinking, oh, man, I'm lost. You know, how could I do this, you know, and crying. You know, it wasn't just too much after that, that the Lord just showered down his love. and said, Brad, I love you. I didn't change anything. It may change you a little bit. It didn't change the way I feel about you. Just get back up on your horse 
and march again. He's been teaching me that ever since then. Get back up on your horse and ride again. You made a mistake. You fell down. You sinned. Get up. He's never kept me down in condemnation. He's never kept me down in the dirt. And I've sinned since I've been a Christian. He's always told me to get up. Put me back on my horse. Give me my robe back. Give me my ring back and say, go tell someone about Jesus. Seriously. All right. So we are justified, and I'm going to end. I got a lot more. You need to take us home and read it. We are justified. That means made right by how? Next one down. By how? By his grace. What does grace mean? Someone tell me, what does grace mean? I can tell we're about done. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm losing some of you. I'm going to end now. I'm going to land. My first landing's coming right now, okay? My first landing. I'm talking about the apostles' doctrine. I'm talking about the gospel of God. I'm talking about the very basis of the apostles' doctrine. Okay, what does grace mean? God's favor and blessing on you that you do not deserve. Just gives it to you. What does the word gift mean? What's a gift? Do you earn a gift? You can't buy it. Remember that commercial? You only get it in boxes of breeze. Remember, am I the only one? <laughs> Jeff's laughing. I guess you got to be over 60 to get this one. Remember it, Jeff? You know, these have commercials. You, can, you only get these towels. Okay. You could only get these towels, Charlie. The only place you could get them, you had to get them free, but you could only get them in boxes of breeze. Couldn't buy them. Couldn't earn them. You had to buy the box of breeze, open it up, boom, there's a towel inside. That's salvation. It's in Jesus. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can only get it in Jesus. Your salvation, it's grace on you. And it is a gift to you. Christmas, does your dad give you a gift at Christmas and say, now you need to mow the grass, cut the wood, and do, do, do. That comes later, right? That's all because you love your dad, right? You do it? Or maybe you're afraid of one of these. But the Christmas stuff is really a gift. Your dad didn't tell you you had to go mow the lawn to get a Christmas gift. Salvation is a gift from God. And get this, this is my point. We're going to build off of here. Righteousness is that gift. You are declared and made righteous before God because of what Jesus did. You are not guilty forever. Paul says in one verse, God doesn't have anything, Allison, even to chide you about. He's put it all away. He can't even chide you anymore with it. You have to receive it. You have to believe it and receive it. And I, won't, I don't have time to go into it. But when you receive this gift of righteousness, something by the grace of God, something in your heart changes toward God. The burden of your sin is removed. And if you're receiving Jesus, repenting of your sins and wanting to follow God, you become a new creation and you get new desires. And if you keep following God, God will revolutionize and change your life by grace. Even our walk with God is by faith through God's grace. We access God's grace by faith. Now, isn't that good news? Righteousness means that you can go approach God at any time through the blood of Jesus Christ. You can go approach God on the merit of Jesus Christ at any time time no matter how bad you feel sometimes i feel bad sometimes my body you know you get depressed your body feels low or something go right to god and press in there and say god your word says that i'm your son your word says that i'm your righteousness that i can pray you can get in there get in the word and you can pray yourself happy you can go right to the glory of god but if you've never received that gift the bible says you're still lost in your sins That gift will make you holy. It'll change how you live. It'll change who you are as a person. But if you've never received that gift, you're in your sins. And the only thing that remains for you to do is to accept Jesus Christ and follow him. I'm not saying you can accept Jesus and then go live in sin that grace may abound. That's not the plan. I don't have time to get into it. But when you receive Jesus, he forgives your sins and he changes you and he puts his law in your heart. He puts his desires in your heart and he begins this process of change as long as you always keep your faith in him. That's good news, isn't it? I'll, I'll teach about holiness and how to walk holy maybe another time. Now, I got a question. I'm not going to make a do a big, long altar call today. Is there anybody out there that's never, in, in the audience too, 
Never receive Jesus, but you want to. Never receive Jesus, but you want to. It's easy if you mean it. You don't know if you died right now. I'm not going to make a long deal of this. You don't know if you died right now that you'd be in heaven. You don't know it. You don't know that you're walking with Jesus, walking with God, but you want to. Is there anybody that wants to give their life to Jesus today? Someone smile at me. Okay. If you decide you, you want to or want to do that, you need to talk to me. You need to come talk to me. It's better to make an open, open public confession. And that's what baptism is. It's an open public confession confession that you've given your life to Jesus. If you've not been baptized, why not? Do you know what in the early church, when they got saved and gave their life to Jesus, they went right in the water? Did you know that? If you've never been baptized, you've never made a public confession of Christ, you need to come see me. You need to make a public confession of Christ and show the world that you're following Jesus. All right. I'm going to go one more. If you don't know that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Like you don't understand people throwing their hands up and people worshiping God or crying or even dancing. Was there anybody dancing? <laughs> you know, you've never been full of the Holy Spirit and you have questions about it. You should come talk to me about it. I can lead you in a prayer. If you're sincere, God will fill you with the Holy Spirit. It happened to me when I didn't even believe in it and it gave me power. That's the day I quit smoking. I'm, I'm done. I'm just finishing up. It's my third landing. That's the day I quit smoking. That's the day I quit drinking. That's the day I threw my playboys away was when I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, NIV. If you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you ought to come talk to me. I'll pray with you. And if you're sincere, God will fill you with the Holy Spirit. You'll have power from heaven. You'll want to start talking to people about Jesus. You won't even be able to help yourself. It just happened. Someone smile, man, I'll end. All right. Father, thank you for this great group of people, Lord, uh, declared righteous by faith in Jesus. I am praying, God, that you will give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of these things. It is such good news. I don't know if we do a good job of sharing it, Lord. It's such outrageously good news that you take away our sin and we're not guilty that, you, Lord, not only that, but you come to live inside of us and guide us and direct us and be everything to us so we can walk in your spirit by faith and just learn to live in the spirit. What a bunch of good news this is. And, Lord, we get to spend eternity with you. We get to be partners with you in your kingdom. I don't know how to tell it any better, Lord, but I pray that we get that revelation, Lord, of just how righteous we really are. It's the righteousness of God that fills us. Open the eyes of our heart. Open the eyes of our understanding and let us get a clear picture of it so we can live in the light of it. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 1204.